Welcome everyone. I um, see that we have 60 participants on this uh, Zoom uh, meeting. And I think it's really telling about how important it is and our commitment to serving a segment of our population that needs our support right now more than ever. Um, I really think that the work you do is critical. It's always been, and it's even more critical now. As we know, life is not like we knew it just a couple of months ago. And people were struggling already um, trying to get through college and with the added um, shelter in place orders and um, closure of businesses, we've experienced significant layoffs. And so this is a health crisis as well as an economic crisis. So we really think that this is a critical time for us to be convening and having a conversation about how we best support our dreamer and undocumented students on college campuses as well as in high school so that they understand the opportunities they have for financial assistance and to know that we have them on our minds and we're being intentional in wanting to serve them and that they are not alone. And so I'm really delighted that I understand we've got Originally, we thought this would be a meeting with um, uh, campus dreamer liaison coordinators, but as I understand, it's expanded to include uh, dreamer liaison coordinators, uh, community organizations that work with our immigrant communities, as well as students. And I really want to welcome the students who are on this call because, as they say, those who are experiencing the problem, know what is best in terms of solutions. So we're so grateful that you're participating in this conversation, as well as developing your leadership skills to be part of advocating for your communities of interest. So I really, I really want to especially thank the students for taking time to help understand what the opportunities are. And I really, um, I really think that it's important that this is a conversation that we obviously at the Student Aid Commission want to provide information to all of you. Even though you're not traditional financial aid officers, you deal with students day in and day out and you understand their financial needs. So we want to hear what you believe is important to understand and how you can best help your students. So we want to help you be as effective as possible. Um, initially, this vision was to have several convenings around the state and uh, to, to have these listening sessions to hear from um, uh, coordinators and, and students and community members about what is needed. Obviously, given the change in our situation, this is a, still a great opportunity to communicate and to communicate all at once and hear each other's ideas. I want to thank Judith Gutierrez and the steering committee that has really envisioned bringing you all together and having an opportunity uh, to have this discussion. This is not a convening we've ever had at the Student Aid Commission, so I'm just thrilled. And I, and I have to tell you that this is a top priority for us. This will not be a one and done. We're here for the long haul and we're here to help students who have limited access to financial aid um, in comparison to their documented peers. So we want to ensure that uh, Dreamer and undocumented students optimize every single financial aid dollar so that they can complete persist and complete their dream of a college education. And you all are part of the community that we're gonna help them every step of the way. Um, we will be, we're working on a number of issues dealing with the immediate COVID-19 crisis that will help uh, relax various requirements, to make it easier for students to apply for um, Cal Grant aid. Uh, we will be making announcements about that once we flesh out the details and figure out the best way in which to enact those changes. One of them that we're looking at is students who are still needing to um, uh, prove verification of registration to the Selective Service Program. As you know, it's a man, or you may know, it's a manual process for undocumented students. And with all the offices closed, it's virtually impossible for them to get that verification. So issues such as that are on our radar. And we're going to be communicating this with the administration and, and figuring out ways we can make some quick changes so that they're not impeded in their access to financial aid. 
So I want to, again, thank you for being part of this discussion. Um, thank all the, the, the individuals who um, helped organize this. And uh, we're here to listen, and we'll keep the conversation going. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Judith. Thank you so much, Marlene, for that welcome. Good morning, everyone. I see we have about 69 people on the call now. I want to thank you all for your energy and your willingness to be on here so early. So, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before we get started, I want to introduce the rest of our team at the California Student Aid Commission, also known as CSAC. You'll be hearing us say CSAC a lot. So I will call on your names, uh, CSAC team, if you're on here. Please introduce your name and just your title, given the, the time constraints and the amount of people we have. I want to make sure we prioritize the conversation. So without further ado, I'll start with our communications task force. I want to thank Michael Lemus. Will you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone, and good morning. My name is Michael Lemus. I'm the media relations manager at CSAC. Thank you. Teresita Martinez. Hello, everyone. My name is Teresita. I am the executive fellow. Patricia Hammond. Good morning, everyone. My name is Patricia Hammond, and I'm the NRM Assistant Deputy Director for uh, Customer Relations. Thank you. Jeffrey Santos. OK. Terry Artica. Good morning, everyone. My name is Terry Artica, and I lead the Institutional Support Unit. Thank you. Karina Gillis. Good morning, everyone. My name is Karina Gillis, and I am a part of the Institutional Support Unit as a Staff Services Analyst. Thank you. Yvonne Hollingsworth. Good morning, everybody. This is Yvonne Hollingsworth, and I'm one of the trainers for the Commission in the Training and Outreach Team. Thank you. Billy Wagner. Good morning. My name is Billy Wagner, and I am the Cash for College Coordinator for the Training and Outreach Unit. Thank you. John Waldrop. Hi guys, my name is John Waldrop. I know a lot of you. I am part of the training and outreach team. Awesome, thank you. Yvette Morales. Good morning everyone. My name is Yvette Morales and I am with the training and outreach unit. Awesome, thank you. CSAC, did I mention anyone, did I miss anyone else? Okay, I also want to give a quick thank you to our legislative analyst who will be joining us later today and as part of our communications task force, Melissa Bardo. We'll be hearing from her soon. Without further ado, let's get started. So just some housekeeping, please stay muted. I am looking at my screen and I will be looking for any raised hands. On your dashboard, you'll have an option to raise your hand if you have a question. You can also open the chat box to share your question or comments with everyone on the chat box or privately with myself, Judith Gutierrez. And I will be looking at those and I will be um, stating what has been written. So as you um, have heard, CSAC recently convened a team known as our Communications Task Force that is developing a webpage filled with financial aid related resources for students and their families in the time of COVID-19. So our goal this morning is to hear from you all as subject matter experts about the concerns that are top of mind for undocumented uh, DREAMer students in California during this crisis. So thank you everyone who has taken the time to join us today and especially thank you students who may be on this call for taking the time to directly voice your concerns. So our communications team will take note of the questions discussed and will compile common questions concerns and topics into one big FAQ under our COVID-19 webpage, which will be launched by the end of this week. So please note that this meeting is being recorded for our future reference and for those who would like notes after. We recognize that these conversations are important and must be held more than once. So please don't look at this meeting as a one and done. You're also able to submit common Q&A in the Google Form link that I am including on our chat box in a few minutes. So I'll be including that on the chat box in a few minutes. There is no deadline to submit any of your concerns or common questions on this Google Form. All responses that are submitted are highly appreciated. Our COVID-19 webpage on the CSAC website 
is a living document, so we will continue to update it with as much information as we can as we start to receive your concerns over time. With that being said, I will open the floor for Q&A. So please raise your hand on the dashboard and I will call on you. Our amazing team that I just introduced from CSAC is here to answer any immediate questions you may have and provide some insight. But really, we want to make this meeting about you all, about building partnership, and about ensuring that you are able to answer concerns and that we take the feedback um, we need to better serve our communities. So with that being said, please be sure to raise your hand and I will go ahead and call on folks. Um, CZAC team, if I miss anything, please let me know. And I am now adding the Google form onto our chat box. So I see we have a hand. Gabby and Sinas. Hi. Uh, you know, um, I wanted to take the opportunity, first of all, to thank you for providing this. And I'm just, you know, so excited to hear from all of you. One of my students recently reached out to me saying she looked at her web grants and she noticed that there was a message that for her Cal Grant renewal will not be processed until July. Um, what does that time frame mean for students? And it's, is that true? Are we looking at a July date for a renewal to even go through? Our campus um, first payment or payment deadline is in July. So my concern is that it might be a little too late. Yeah. Thank you, Gabby. Do we have any responses to that answer? I mean, excuse me, to that question? Hi, Gabby. This is Patricia Hammond. And um, um, so renewals, um, students who are renewing their Cal Grant um, normally are being renewed between uh, between June and July. We normally um, do not um, go all the way up to July, but it may take up to that. So, but it's between May, I would say May to, Ju to June for sure. So, um, but yeah, the renewal students take a little, they don't, they're not renewed right away. The more important thing is that they do have their um, application submitted um, as early as possible. And, um, and then they'll hear from us um, once, or they need to check their uh, web runs students account um, sometime between, I would definitely recommend that they check their account between May and, um, June. Um, we normally don't take up to July, but we'll, we'll take a look at that um, message that they're seeing there just to um, make it a little more clear. Thank you for letting us know that. Okay, no, thank you so much. And uh, I'll just make sure that um, the student is, you know, vigilant on looking on that and, and I'll help her throughout the process. No. Thank you. Thank you. Marlene. Hi, uh, thank you for that question, um, uh, Gabby. I think that, uh, and I wanted to ask this of you, Patricia, it, because they haven't heard until July, as a renewal student, they typically will be renewed, right? If there's not, they're probably worrying about whether or not they're gonna get another Cal Grant. Unless their economic situation has changed dramatically, do you think they should have you know, a good amount of confidence that they are gonna get renewed? So Marlene, so yes, that is a very good question. So um, we, yeah, we should probably, um, and that's very good feedback from Gabby, because we probably, that'll help us to go ahead and maybe send a communication to the students to let them know that uh, we do have your, um, we do have your application. Uh, please know that you will be renewed around this time so that they have a peace of mind and not worry about it. We'll work on that. Great, thank you so much. I see Wendy Ortega Garrett has her hand up. I'm so sorry if I butchered your name. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I wanted to, I had to, I put one question in the chat box, um, but I have two questions. Um, will CSAC be providing any written guidance similar to what's been issued by the CARES Act for withdrawals? Uh, related to um, Cal Grant recipients? For instance, if a student withdraws, will they be allowed to retain 100% of their Cal Grant that was dispersed um, if they withdrew related to the emergency? Uh, the Federal CARES Act does provide that kind of um, guidance related to R2T4s uh, for federal student aid. And so I was hoping that something would come out in writing from CSAC.
This is Marlene. Um, I think that's a great idea, and uh, we can put that guidance on the new COVID-19 website that will be coming out. And it will also be a good question to address in our FAQ. And then my second, thank you Marlene, and my second question is related to transfer entitlements. And my questions are not, ne my questions are uh, more, not necessarily specifically related to DREAM students, but uh, all of our Cal Grant recipients. Will um, typically our transfer entitlement students have to complete, you know, like the G6 form? And they may have difficulty providing any sort of documentation or transcripts from the high school. Um, and so I was wondering if any concessions might be made for our transfer entitlement students related to document documenting their um, that they graduated from a California high school. I will address that question as well. That's one of the issues we're looking at. I should share with you that there are three issues that affect students immediately and because of closures it makes it really difficult for students to get verification so the three areas that we're looking at is one um, waiving the requirement that students have to verify that they graduated from high school two delaying the d uh, verification period to um, verify their gpas until se september 2nd and three, the waiving the selective service verification requirement um, temporarily for this year, for this spring term, for, for the upcoming Cal Grant. So those are three areas that we're looking at. And as soon as we get word that we're able to do this, we will definitely be announcing that on our COVID-19 um, landing page. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. I received a question from Javier, and it says, can CSAC assist transfer students auto-qualify for Cal Grant B if they once qualified for Cal Grant A? Our student need to petition to qualify even after stating that they are transferring, excuse me, they're transferring and admitted as transfer students. Do we have any responses from our CSAC team? I'm copying the question onto our chat box. Make sure you share your questions with everyone, please. Patricia, did you want to take that one? Yeah, so I'm reading the question because I didn't really understand it. Uh, so let me read it really quick. Um, So the question is, looks like um, is uh, if a student who auto qualifies for Cal Grant B, it looks like they want to switch from a Cal Grant to another Cal Grant. And that's the question if they would, they will need to follow the process. So if they feel that they uh, should be qualifying for, an, uh, for another different Cal Grant, they really need to uh, contact their financial aid advisor on that. Um, and then they will be working with their um, financial aid advisor. Um, what we are advising students um, because of the current situation, if they're having trouble um, contacting their financial aid advisor in regards to switching Cal grants, because there's specific um, requirements for that or situations. Um, and it's not a one um, simple answer that can apply to everyone. So um, we really recommend that the student works with the financial aid advisor. If they're not able to do that, then they can definitely contact us, uh, student support, and, and um, we, could definitely, we can definitely try to see what we can do for them or uh, try to work with the school to find out how we can help the student address the question or the request. Thank you, Patricia. We have Maria Rodriguez, then Priscilla's question after that, and Wendy will get to you after Priscilla. So, Maria? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria, and I had a question about the previous question that was asked about push deadlines for, um, for web grants. Um, and so I was wondering if that was only in particular to transfer students, or is it also for incoming freshmen for college? Um, I am asking because I... Um, I am working with a student at the moment um, to try to resend, to, up, to re-upload their 
um, their GPA upon graduation because that would make them eligible for Cal Grant um, based on their EFC. And so I'm wondering if that deadline would be pushed towards September like you guys once said, um, or was that only for transfer students? That applies to all students. Okay, got it. Thank you. But it hasn't been approved yet because it requires a statutory change. So we're looking at various options for making that change. And our, 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 our request is um, it's a high, high priority because of the urgent need to provide that information to students and, and educators. Right. So then um, if the deadline gets pushed um, towards the fall, would that, um, what do you think would be the turnaround time for a student to receive um, or qualify for Cal Grant if their GPA is going to be uploaded um, that late? I think what we're prepared to do is, is qualify them as quickly as possible. And if, in fact, we find that it's just too difficult because of closures, we might, it, it's a little complicated to waive the GPA altogether because our system is, um, is programmed to use the GPA to, um, to um, uh, qualify for the competitive grant program. So we need it for the competitive grant program, the Cal Grant B. We don't need it for the other's um, entitlement. So we will probably be able to issue the grants um, for entitlement well before um, September 2nd. So we're going to need to clarify that point and we'll differentiate between the entitlement students and the competitive grant students. Because we have two um, groups of competitive students. We have the ones that applied by May 2nd and then we have the ones that need to apply by September 2nd. So um, we have to use the um, GPA for the scoring matrix that we use to, to determine who gets a competitive grant because it's a highly competitive program. So that's a really good point for us to think about if there's a way for us to release, to confirm and release those grants before September 2nd. That's a question that I'm gonna take back to our technical team. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So it seems Priscilla's question on the Zoom group chat is about a step-by-step -step process for creating web grants. And our CSAC teammate, Michael Lemus, has provided a link to a step-by-step -step YouTube video for anyone who is interested that is on the chat box. So Wendy, we'll go ahead and hand it over to you. I thought of another um, question related to um, Chafee students. I know it's not specifically Cal Grant specific, but um, the Chafee students might experience delays or difficulty obtaining their um, foster care verification form if the county departments or if the Department of Social Services offices are closed or remote, they might have difficulty obtaining that. Um, and so I just wanted to bring up that point so that um, that could be taken into consideration for Chafee students. They're a very vul vulnerable population of students. Um, and so uh, they already need additional guidance and resources and may be greatly affected by this. Thank you, Wendy. This is Patricia. Um, I would definitely suggest that any um, any, any student, for that matter, Chafee um, students in particular, they contact us uh, if they're having any um, any challenges or um, that they have encountered because of the situation that we're in. So definitely, the communication between the student and us is very important, so that we're able to see how we can help them. So please encourage the students to contact us if they run into uh, situations, but that could be also um, possibly um, an FAQ question that we can put out there um, as well. Thank you both. We have a question from Erica Gutierrez. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, in October, uh, when Long Beach City College hosted a training from CSAC, there was mention of a like a work study program for the California Dream applicants. 
And I just yeah, wanted to see, has there been new information about that or any guidance that has been provided to the schools about it? No. This is Terry Artica. I can speak more to that. The program you're referring to is the California Dreamer Service Incentive Grant Program. We are currently working with institutions and advocacy groups in preparing the program for rollout. The goal is to have it roll out with the new academic year in 2021. So the new academic year starts July 1st. So our goal is to have um, marketing material, um, application forms, as well as a website up and running um, at that time. Uh, I, for Dreamers, I would just let them know that the application period would also start on July 1st, so be on the lookout for that information. Through our system, we're able to identify uh, Dreamers who have received um, a Count Grant B award, and our intent is to send notification to them that the, uh, when the program is rolled out. So we will also uh, send some type of notification to those students as long as they're in uh, the web grant system. I guess my question is more regarding, because um, I need to recruit people willing to hire them. So I kind of need guidance on what it is on the supervisor end and whatnot. That information will be on the website and uh, it's a volunteer service for uh, community and service organizations. And those organizations will have the responsibility of tracking the service hours that are required to receive the grant. So that will, information will also be on the website. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So we have a question from Teresita Curiel. Good morning. Um, the program, incentive program that was being discussed, that is completely new to me. Can you provide a little bit more information? Sure, this is Terry again. So in the uh, last year's legislation and the, the legislature, um, here, I can, right. I can step I'm in on that, that um, sure. Terry. So last year in the governor's 2019-20 uh, budget, they approved four new programs for the Student Aid Commission to administer. And one of them is the Dreamer Incentive Service Grant. And this was really the result of Assemblymember Monique Limon's legislation to provide a, a, a service program for undocumented students. And the rationale being that they, many of them are not permitted to work, they're not DACA students, and therefore have no way to, um, to, to, to um, earn uh, a living, uh, to, to, to work. So this was an opportunity to provide them funding, 1,500, and correct me if I'm wrong, team, I think it's 1,500 for service work for a semester, and they'd have to verify and, 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 and complete their service and have their supervisors complete their service to get that funding. And it would be added to their Cal Grant Award because they would have to be Cal Grant students. And um, we're in the process of developing the details for this program right now and uh, working closely with the administration and Cal volunteers to try to identify uh, vol volunteer sites up and down the state that are close to all the different um, college institutions and uh, to make it as easy as possible for students to take advantage of this opportunity. So it's a way to supplement their Cal grant uh, without having to work, it's kind of like the service version of work study. Thanks, Marlene. And the award is three thousand dollars per academic year, which translates into fifteen hundred dollars per semester or a thousand dollars per quarter. 
And so the required service requirement is 150 hours per semester or 100 hours per quarter, which is 300 hours per academic year. Thank you, everyone. Do you have any more questions? Maricela? Would this program be um, administered by financial aid offices and the different colleges, or like would there be a partnership with the undocumented student centers? Do we know this information yet? So this is something that's being developed right now. Um, we're, we're in the process of identifying sites, and a key part of this identification is that they would be sites that are friendly to our undocumented students. So I believe that organizations would be able to apply for this to be a site. So like if you're a CalSOAP program, you know, what, you know, that would be a good placement for a student to participate um, in, in, in the CalSOAP program and that count towards service work. But that's, those are the details that are being fleshed out now because it's creating a whole statewide infrastructure to ensure that it's a quality experience for the students. We also have a question from Erica Gutierrez on our chat box. It says, so students will not work on campus, and I'm hoping Terry and your team, maybe we can clarify that question, the on-campus option or off-campus. Sure, this is Terry again. Um, the students have a myriad of options of, to, pro, to, um, to complete their service hours. So it's, uh, it can be on campus, so it could be with eligible um, um, institutions, you know, such as the, the school that they um, attend. They can also perform service with a myriad of, you know, nonprofit organizations that are either on campus or off campus. And they can also, if they are currently um, providing a volunteer work with an organization that is not based with either one, they can have that organization uh, register with the commission and we can make sure that they um, meet the requirements and um, the student can then continue their service at that organization. So it's a very broad where, um, where you can um, complete your service hours. The, their, um, the key requirements is that, you know, it's, um, it's related to um, it's related kind of to the student's um, field of study, and it can't be of a you know like a political advocacy type um, situation. And again, we'll have those um, items on our website when it's when it's uh, complete. Thank you, Terry. Wendy has had her hand up. Wendy, do you want to go ahead? Um, okay, so I have two questions. Um, my first question is related to um, the 2021 <clears throat> CADA. Um, we've seen an influx at the CSU, and I'm sure at all schools across the state, where students' parents are now becoming dislocated workers because they've lost employment. Um, due to the emergency. And <clears throat> I was hoping that you could speak a little bit about um, how that might impact um, Cal Grant eligibility. For instance, if a student was initial on their initial FAFSA, I'm sorry, not FAFSA, on their initial CADA may have been um, not Cal Grant eligible, or, uh, but now they're going back in to update it to indicate their parents are now dislocated workers due to loss of employment. Um, can you speak a little bit about how that might affect their eligibility for Cal Grant for 2021? This is Patricia. So um, if the student experiences a change in income, 
um, they would need to uh, work, um, they need to work with the financial aid advisor on that and so that they can explain the, the change on income and that happens, that's, that's happened in the past with other students. So um, the, financial aid the financial aid office will have to make a, um, a decision um, on that based on the information that the student is providing to the financial aid advisor. So, and then if the financial aid office, um, based on the information that they receive from the student, agrees that we need to consider that student uh, for a Cal grant, and then they'll work directly with the institution support um, unit, uh, who is Terry's team, and so that, that we can make the appropriate changes in our system. I just am concerned that there might be a large influx of students and will the Cal Grant program be able to um, handle that increased volume in awards? Hi, Wendy, this is Marlene. Uh, this is really something we've been thinking a lot about and how, because right now the current process is for, to get word from the local campuses, for them to recommend or um, that students go in and amend their FAFSAs. And because there could, could potentially be a lot of students in this category, we have this on the agenda for our financial aid advisory board meeting today to talk to them and figure out how we can best capture uh, this group of students given the sudden change in their family income or their own income. So yes, we, we, we recognize there are gonna be a lot of students in this category. And I think that part of it is gonna be coordinating with the local campuses because they have the emergency federal funds that they're distributing. So, you know, much of it is trying to capture those students at their local campus because they've got quite a bit of free reign to, to give um, out emergency grants for basic needs. But we can coordinate with them for some students might be able to um, it, it become eligible for financial aid if they had previously been um, declared ineligible. So that's what we're going to be needing to coordinate with students to try to expand the safety net and capture as many of these students as possible. But it is a work in progress and we recognize that's a, that's a real issue. And then my second question, because I had two, um, is um, can you speak a little bit about the status of Cal Grant reform? Um, I understand that there's a lot of um, discussions that have been going on and could that or is that going to be delayed or put on pause um, in response to the emergency? Yes, that's a very good question. As a matter of fact, you know, we had the Cal Grant Working Group and came up with a, what we believe was a really solid proposal to streamline and enhance basic, uh, basic needs grants, non-tuition aid. And um, we issued the report on March 6th. And then of course, the week after that, that's when we were all, the world changed before our eyes. So what we've done is we've put it on pause. We do not want to lose the momentum we had built, but we've kind of phased it. And we're saying right now is phase one emergency. And this is the time when we're focusing and working with our institutional partners to try to get uh, emergency funds to students with greatest need. And that's primarily through the local campuses. Phase two, we're looking at ways in which we could po possibly enhance some grant aid to some of our um, Cal Grant students in the fall, but under the existing Cal Grant program. Uh, we're having conversations about that now. We don't have a green light about whether that's possible, but we're looking at ways in which we can incorporate new funding and emergency funding into some of the financial aid in the fall. Next year, we're hoping that we can look at um, laying the groundwork to implement a um, no new funding Cal Grant framework that takes the work that we did to streamline it into Cal Grant 4 and Cal Grant 2, making it a lot easier for administrators to administrate and also especially for students to understand and take full advantage. And then the fourth phase of the plan is the full funding. And we're in conversations about what that might look like to try to get funding to fund the full um, implementation of Cal Grant as the way uh, we initially envisioned. So it is going to take more of a phase and approach. Right now, all hands and all eyes are on the, the immediate health and economic crisis, but we think investments in Cal Grant 
reform will help us be you know a strategic part of the economic recovery by helping students persist and graduate so we'll have more on that we'll keep regular updates on that Thank but, you. but for now we don't we, we we don't see much of it moving except that we continue to emphasize the need to fund basic needs and that's one area that california has not done as well in in the past and so we're keeping that message front and center, certainly in this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene and Wendy. We have a hand up from Cynthia Gonzalez. Hi, um, so I just had a question. Um, isn't our institutions considered nonprofits? So for the California Dreamer Service Incentive Grant, um, can the schools be the nonprofit or does it have to be an outside nonprofit? Yes, schools are included in that. So they wouldn't need to work with outside organizations. They could just do it within. The short, the short answer is yes. We're trying to give the students as, men, as much flexibility as possible to fulfill the service requirement. So in terms of working on campus, um, you know, I, there might be um, organizations that are on campus that work with particular institutions that will have opportunities for the um, volunteer service but it will differ based on the campus and what programs are available. Does this include uh, K through 12 schools? Oh, that's a great question. I will need to research that one. Thank you, everyone. I know we had some students on our registered list, and I want to say some are on the line, so I want to also provide a space for our students to directly comment on any concerns that may be top of mind for them right now with COVID-19. Are there any students on the line that would like to share some questions? Okay, seeing none, you are more than welcome to chime in anytime, raise your hand, or include a question on the chat box. We have a question from Erica Gutierrez. Good morning again. Thank you again for doing this. Um, my experience, I work at a community college and um, over the last 15 years, I've seen students enroll at a Cal State or UC or at another four-year university. They use their Cal grants there and for whatever reason, they make the change and they change to a community college and they no longer have access to their Cal grant um, until they transfer back to a four-year. In light of the current situation, I do see that a lot of students have already changed from the four-year to the community college or have been receiving phone calls from students. And I was wondering if that would be possible for them to still use their Cal Grant when they switch over. My particular concern is for the California Dream applicants. Thank you. This is Patricia. Um, and so, are you referring to students who ha who were at a four-year college, um, but then they're going back to a community college? Uh, well, they're enrolling at a community college after being at a four-year, yes. And uh, so, it, it, Jeff, do you want to address that, that question, just to make sure I get it right? Yeah, and I'm sorry, um, uh, can you repeat the question one more time? So, um, in the past, uh, students that were previously enrolled at a four-year college and used their Cal Grant at the four-year college or university, for whatever reason, they changed their enrollment to a community college. During their time at the community college, they no longer had access to the Cal Grant. Uh, would this change because uh, I do have some students that have already reached out because they want to be closer to home they're thinking of enrolling at the community college or they are going to enroll at the community college and they wanted to know what would happen to their financial aid. Currently, my guidance is they would lose the Cal Grant and, but they would receive other kinds of aid. But this is not something I can suggest to my California Dream applicants. 
I just inform them, hey, uh, you're not going to have access to your Cal Grant. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what type of Cal Grant they're receiving. So it's kind of a more individual basis we would have to look at that question under. The reason I say that is if a student's awarded a Cal Grant B at a four-year university, and then they transfer to a community college, it is possible for them to continue to receive their stipend amount while at the community college, but that would continue to detract from their remaining eligibility of the award. If it was a Cal Grant A, then you are correct, they would not be eligible to receive that Cal Grant A while at the community college. It would be placed into a reserve status until they transferred back to the four-year university. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And this is Karina with the California Student Aid Commission. Just to follow up on that, the only exception for that would be if the student was a recipient of the Students with Dependent Children Award Cal Grant A, in which case they would still have access or have eligibility to use their access portion of the Cal Grant A. So that would be the only exception to that. I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you, everyone. Do we have any more questions? Erica? I wanted to follow up on the question I heard earlier. Um, it sounded like uh, the person was suggesting that there might be an increase of students that would be qualified for Cal grants because of their family's change of income. And my understanding of the question is, does the uh, commission have the capacity to address uh, an increase? And I really didn't understand the answer. This is Steve Caldwell. We do have the capacity in the entitlement program. So if students do qualify now and they apply it on time for the Cal Grant entitlement programs, we would be able to have the capacity to add awards. The competitive program is a limited program, so that would be a little bit different. Um, they'd have to compete for those awards. So we, we have not had an increase this year due to COVID-19 in our competitive program, but the entitlement program, yes, we would be able to uh, award those students who became eligible if they applied on time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I also want to remind folks that if there are any questions that come up after this call as well, our Google form, which I will continue to add the link on our chat box, will be made available even after the call and so on. There is no deadline to submit questions on our Google form and we will be tracking it to provide as much information as possible on our website, FAQ. But these questions now are very helpful. We appreciate your insight. So we have no hands raised. So if you have any questions, please let me know. We have Erica. Thank you for this opportunity again. Um, I did remember that um, it was mentioned in the beginning about um, collaborating with the financial aid office for the students that applied for FOSFA and they may get additional assistance by the CARES Act. And I guess my question is, what is the assistance that we're gonna be able to provide uh, the California Dream applicants um, if they need more assistance um, because of the pandemic, uh, if there's any? Um, would you mind repeating that uh, the question one more time? I'm sorry. So the CARES Act is going to provide guidance or is providing guidance that we're going to be able to provide additional assistance for students that applied for the FOSFA. So if a student uh, expresses that they need emergency aid, uh, they, there, there will be a way for them to get more assistance. 
but this is currently not available to the California Dream applicants. And I was kind of hoping that I would hear something if there was going to be additional assistance for them or some kind of mechanism for them to receive additional support. So one thing that we do know um, is that for anyone that is experiencing any kind of financial hardships, whether it be um, from a Dreamer standpoint or a FAFSA filer, um, they can reach out to their institutions as there has been money allocated to those institutions uh, for emergency funds. And we do know that a lot of this is from the federal uh, government, but uh, those universities also have discretionary funds that they can use to help their students as need be. Um, I, I don't think there's anything that I'm aware of that is specifically outlined for DREAMers um, or undocumented students in general. Uh, but that does not mean that individual sites can't allocate certain funding to that population if they deem it to be a necessity, in which I'm sure a lot of them are in considerations for that. Thank you, everyone. Seeing we don't have any more hands raised, I'd like to turn over, sort of ask folks for their insight on basic needs situations. What are basic needs looking like for students, for undocumented students right now, COVID-19? We have Gabby. And then Wendy. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, so one of the things that we've been hearing with students um, is definitely rent assistance, right? Right now, folks are hurting to pay their rent. Um, as you know, many of our Dreamer students, our parents are also undocumented and they rely on jobs that are perhaps, um, you know, they, they've been um, laid off or what have you. So that has been the biggest need right now that we've been hearing. And of course, um, for our non-DACA students is where do we go from here in terms of um, since they cannot lo get lawful employment, you know, what are other options for them in terms of supplementing some sort of semblance of an income that they had as a family? And we still find a lot of misinformation out there with our, even our DACA students, a lot of them are still afraid to apply for unemployment benefits because they fear that it's still going to hurt them with this public charge notion. So we've been doing a lot of um, correcting of information, but also trying to get assistance for students um, just to, you know, sustain um, their current home that they're renting. Thank you, Gabby. <clears throat> Excuse me, that is definitely something we'd have to keep in mind. It is a very important issue um, given the situation we're in. Does anyone from our CSAC team want to respond? Uh, sure. Um, so that is a... Um, terribly... Because as I mean, most of us know, if they don't have DACA status, the best uh, form of income that they can actually pursue is starting up, you know, a business of their own. Um, and that's not necessarily a reasonable um, expectation for a lot of students. It's not to say that they can't, uh, but it is definitely a, a hardship for this community. And um, unfortunately, I, I haven't heard anything really past that at this point. I do want to also point out that on our CSAC webpage for COVID-19, we will provide CSAC-related information for students. 
uh, financial aid in related information, but we will also try to provide external links to other organizations working around these issues. And you know, Gabby will continue to keep that as top of mind when we look for these resources. So thank you. Next we have Wendy, then Eric and Alonso. So Wendy, go ahead. I, can you hear me? I um, want to second what was just stated. A lot of um, students are reaching out regarding loss of employment and uh, changes in income. Uh, housing insecurity is huge uh, with regards to being unable to pay rent, mortgages, things like that. Um, we have food insecurity, a lot of food insecurity, um, fears about going out, you know, to grocery stores and things like that. And if they lost their employment, they're having to prioritize, do I want to eat or have a roof over my head? Um, and so like at the CSU, all of our food pantries are still open, but um, resources to obtain uh, food, local food banks, things like that are huge, that students are looking for that information um, to be able to get resources because they're having to make difficult decisions right now about you know, housing versus eating, um, let alone being able to have web, you know, web access, internet access to do their online coursework. Thank you, Wendy. Next we have Eric Ramirez. Hi, good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. First off, thanks again, CSAC, um, for hosting this. Thank you to, to all my colleagues who you know, are on the call and just sharing wonderful information and asking really pertinent questions. Um, this is really, really valuable. Um, I just want to echo what's been said. I think the main issue that I've been seeing is uh, same thing, loss of employment, either by the student directly or by a parent or somebody in the family who is kind of the, the main breadwinner, and so it's impacting our students um, significantly. Uh, a lot of questions regarding rent. Um, you know, I had to educate myself on the, the moratorium and what it means and what the process looks like and guiding students through that. Um, there's still some questions even with that rent, right? Um, if, if students, even just get deferred payment on rent this month, um, that doesn't mean they're going to be able to afford two months of rent next month or three months of rent the month after that. And so I think that's a concern that I, I suspect a lot of you on this call share that even with some of the protections that have been put in place for rent and utilities, it's not like they're, they're eliminating payments, they're deferring them. And I think a lot of these students and families are going to struggle to, to make payment um, even in the future. And so you know, hopefully there's other types of funding. And I've been in conversations um, with city officials and, and not myself, but in, in you know, com uh, different convenings that I've been a part of. It's, I think it's really been echoed that, you know, the cities and, and, and the counties and really the state of California are going to have to step up and invest in, in, in our immigrant communities particularly. Um, I also just want to echo real quick what was mentioned about the food pantries. I agree, right? Sac State, we have a food pantry, and I, I remind students that it's open even during, um, you know, the virtual times that we're in right now, um, but also sharing other food pantries. Um, there's some really good resources. I'll put one in. Um, actually, I think it's Informed Immigrant has one where it kind of tells you about different resources throughout different areas of California, particularly related to the food, to food insecurity. So I've found that that's really helpful. Um, so definitely, I think we're all seeing a lot of the similar issues. I quickly also want to address um, and just comment on the question that was asked about funding from the CARES Act. Um, I was on a call yesterday with some of our campus officials, and that question came up as well. And it sounds as though the, the language in the bill is vague enough to where it doesn't really say that only students, you know, that are, are U.S. citizens or permanent residents can benefit from the funding that's going to be given to each institution. My takeaway from that conversation is that it's really going to come down to the different systems and how they interpret the law. And so I, I don't think we know really if, if our undocumented students are going to benefit at all from the funding that's going to be given to various institutions of higher education. But from what I understand is that it'll be interpreted either by, you know, each system or by each campus and their legal team 
So I just wanted to kind of throw those two cents in as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Eric. We have Alonso and then Cynthia. Alonso, go ahead. Hi, thank you for hosting today's event. Um, echoing everybody's sentiments around meeting basic needs. Um, I did share a resource in the chat box um, by our partners um, at Immigrants Rising. They have a Beyond the DACA page um, that has some great resources and information on how students can make um, and generate income outside of just um, starting their own business. Um, and then at the foundation, or at, sorry, and I'm with the Foundation for California Community Colleges, um, and we surveyed our colleges a few weeks ago, and we, you know, we have, um, we received similar information that's been shared, you know, accessing to food, unemployment benefits, consist and then, you know, having consistent and reliable information. Um, so, at the foundation and in partnership with the chancellor's office that we do have an undocumented student resource page that's updated by myself and the chancellor's office on a daily basis that has resources and information um, but outside of that we're also using our partnership with nine legal service providers across the state to provide resource and guidance on um, a lot of the issues that are coming up and so we're going to be using um, some webinars and resource development over the next few weeks to really meet the needs of our students and I'll be I can share more information as resources are developed. Um, also, the Immigrant Legal Resource Center is a partner of ours and will be creating some resource and guidance around public charge and accessing um, COVID-19 um, healthcare should they should a student be um, diagnosed with it. So we're going to do everything that we can to continue to support um, our students. Um, but if there are, I'm happy to share our survey results with anybody that's interested um, in figuring out ways that we can all combine our bandwidth and capacities to really help and um, distribute accurate resources in, the, in this most um, unprecedented time. And um, I saw a question, and all of our webinars are open to anyone that wants to get legal information. We do have one following this call at noon on different ways that individuals can get um, a green card. Um, so I'll share the link in the chat box as well, um, but in my email address where you can contact me um, should you have any questions on the resources or want to partner up and being able to work collaboratively together to best share these resources. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alonso. We had a hand raised from Cynthia, but I don't see it anymore. Cynthia, did you still want to go ahead? Not Steve, you have your hand up. Yeah, I've, I've heard a few questions. This is Steve Caldwell at Student Aid Commission. And I've heard some questions about the distribution of aid from the segments. And I wanted to say, I think Marlene mentioned it, but we are going to be meeting with our Financial Aid Advisory Board, which is uh, made up of all the segmental representatives and the high schools as well, and some people from campuses. So we're going to meet with them every other week, and we'll be talking more. One of our topics is about the um, distribution of the aid that's available. So we can ask some of these questions as well, and I think they'll bring them up on the call, but we wanna make sure that uh, we're helping as much as we can, but that most of the emergency funding is going through the campuses. So we'll talk to them about that, and um, hopefully uh, we'll be able to get some answers there. Thank you, Steve. We have Gabby, then Wendy. So yes, uh, on that note, when you meet with um, campus representatives, and I would urge and encourage you to really talk to them about um, th these types of emergency funds or, or the distribution of funds to really um, let our campus officials know the importance of also 
um, including undocumented students, sometimes the information, um, they tend to take information and um, not really fully understand the scope or maybe because they think it's coming from federal funds, they might take that as a sign to say, okay, well, it's only for the FAFSA students, but not for the DREAM Act students. So I would really encourage your advocacy on this as you talk to these campus officials so that they understand that um, we don't need to limit, um, this is not a time to limit, um, you know, these funds that hopefully they can, we can distribute them as best as possible. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. She's muted still talking before I got unmute, I unmuted myself. Um, I wanted to know how will the um, webinar going, not webinar, I'm sorry, the web, the new web page you're developing, how will you communicate that it's now live? Will it go out in the operations memo, a special alert to campuses, and, um, or will it just go live without Notification. I just want to make sure our campus, we start directing our campuses at the appropriate time to that web page. Hey, Judith, I can, I can speak to that. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. This is Michael. So for the website, we're working on a multi-tiered marketing approach. So we definitely will be sending out an alert um, to the schools and the institutions. We're definitely also working on social media, so making sure that everyone can see it across our platforms. So we'll be sending out formal notices. Um, we're set to go ahead and launch it at the very latest by Friday, but we're aiming to try our best to get it done by tomorrow. And knowing that it's a living document, so definitely if there are resources that you all know about that you think should be on that website to definitely let us know. But we're definitely going to be using a multi-tiered approach, so definitely sending out those official alerts to schools um, as well as social media. But if there are any other ways that you feel like we should communicate, um, feel free to bring that up now, and then we can definitely put that into our plan. Well, I just wanted to add that the NASFA, our National Association of oh, Financial yeah. Aid Administrators, their COVID-19 webpage is fantastic. And one of the key things that I, one of the key things that I really appreciate it about their website is that they indicate when something is new. So as things uh, pop, as new information comes out or is developed or published, they do mark it as new. So that way we know as the readers or the consumers of the information, oh, this is something that is new, so it changed from whatever it was yesterday or it was updated or revised. They're kind of highlighting that, so it would be great if you guys could do something similar, not, not exactly the same, but just let us know or highlight something that's new or it's been updated or revised from whatever it was original, however it was originally communicated. That would be great. Absolutely, yes, and thank you. We're aware of the NASA organization, so yeah, I know they've, they've been putting out some really great information. In addition to that, on the new website, you all will get to go ahead and see, we're working out a system to go ahead and have some sort of subscription system where you all can go ahead and put your emails, and actually, if you're looking for up-to-date COVID-19 related information from CSAC, since we're going to be continuously updating it, as that gets updated, if you are wanting those updates, um, go, go, you can go ahead and actually subscribe. So we're working out a, the back end of just our technology heading make up something where you all can go ahead and get those up to date um, announcements as they come out as well. Thank you. That sounds great. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Do we have any other questions or comments? Hi, Judy. This is Patricia. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to do um, really encourage um, to tell students to call us if they have any questions, concerns. Um, our customer service uh, for students is being opened and there has been no disruption to our service to the students. So we continue to serve them Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.45 p.m. We are um, answering our emails. They, they come in through student support. So please, if your students have any questions in regards to their Cal Grant or they're struggling on getting anything that is on their way, 
we may not have all the answers, but we definitely uh, see what we can do for them to help them. Uh, we're very focused on them, helping them, and um, we feel um, very unfortunate that this is going on and it's happening, but we're here to support them. And I just wanna make sure that you know that, that we're here to help them. And please encourage the students to contact us and um, so that we can provide some help to them. Thank you. And I just saw Carrie's question. So Carrie, for the social media PR packets, I'm gonna go ahead and put down my email. So if any of you actually want to go ahead and get those, so when it's ready to go ahead and share across social media platforms, I would love to go ahead and send those to you all. So I'll go ahead and put my email down. And if you all just wanna go ahead and email your contact information, as soon as those are available, I will go ahead and go and send those out. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I want to open up the floor again to any students that are on the call. The discussion is about hearing what is top of mind for you. What are your concerns? So please feel free to chime in. Anything is helpful. Again, our web page is a living document, so we will continue to update it with any information we receive from all your insight um, and your guidance. So we appreciate this conversation and any future conversations as well. I, this is Wendy. I have one last thing I wanted to say. Um, so I, I hear what everybody's saying regarding the CARES Act funding and um, the eligibility of undocumented students, but I think that the reason that some legal um, or the legal representation for schools and systems that are questioning eligibility is because there's conflicting federal laws. Um, there is a, a federal law called um, the, I'm looking for the name, it's in my email. Um, sorry about this, it is the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reform Act. And so um, that law kind of prohibits um, uh, undocumented persons from receiving any federal monies and that it does definitely, at least from what we hear from advocacy groups and from um, uh, some legal uh, represent, representatives for students is that sometimes uh, receipt of federal funds affects their eligibility at a future date to um, obtain permanent residency or citizenship. And so I think that's where um, legal counsel for systems and for campuses are tentative in um, jumping the gun to say, yeah, this money is going to be eligible without um, specific clarification from the Federal Department of Education um, so that we know that our campuses and our students won't be negatively affected down the road um, if they do if they are recipients of these funds so I think that's why um, there is some hesitation to just um, say yes when the law has only been in place or the CARES Act has only been in place for a week and a half and we I know that students are needing the money. That's why we were kind of looking towards the Student Aid Commission to try to do something for the Dreamer students because um, at the state level um, our approach is a little bit different than at the federal level. Um, not to say that I don't think it's not like a personal opinion about whether obviously I'm an advocate for our dream population. Um, it's just that I think that that's where there's hesitation to say yeah let's give the money to um, undocumented students because there are repercussions that they could potentially be um, facing later without us having definitive guidance that they are eligible for federal funds. Thank you, Wendy. Do we have any responses? Are there any follow-up questions? OK, 
Okay, seeing none, we have about 10 minutes left on this call. Again, this is an ongoing conversation. So please feel free. I will continue to post the Google form link on the chat box um, and we will follow up via email with participants to ensure that you get the information you need after this call as well, such as the links we've shared um, and the email addresses that are being shared. If we can get as many as possible. But we hope that you will submit questions and concerns in that Google form so that we can continue to update our web page. Do we have any last thoughts? We have a raised hand from Brian. Yes. Um, hi, I'm a student at a community college and as a student, we are being impacted the most as undocumented students. Our college professor faculty are making the decision and not really taking student feedback to consideration when it comes to our grades and how that imp impacts our mental health. Plus thinking about it, when we don't make grades, this affect our financial aid. Like if we receive the Cal Dream Act, Cal Grant, we understand that they want student imp input, but we, I don't think we are really being heard. And if we are, it's only being heard like to a certain degree. We understand that faculty and professor are aware that many students are dealing with the stress and not, not only for themselves, but their family as well, dealing with rent bill and the struggle for food. Some colleges are putting in the effort and distributing food back for students, but I want to share this with y'all. Um, this is uh, affecting us not only with lack, lacking with funds, but immensely affecting our mental health. Thank you so much, Brian. CSAC team, would anyone like to respond? And Judith, I'll go ahead and say just a few words. So Brian, one, I just want to first start off by just saying thank you for being vulnerable in this space and for sharing your story because this, this truly is all about the students. So we appreciate you sharing. I think for a resource, um, and every school, of course, manages this differently. But when it comes to, you know, grades and professors and the faculty at the colleges, usually that's under the academic affairs division of your school. So I would highly recommend go, getting in contact with them if you do even a search for your school and academic affairs. Um, a lot of those decisions are made from that division. Again, it depends on the school. But I would recommend reaching out or to a staff member at your college or your university that you feel like you can go ahead and share this with because they can often be like many of the people on this call, your advocate. So they can go ahead and help out or at least put you into contact with someone that may be able to assist with that because we know there's a lot of concerns um, and there's a lot of transition of course going on with your classes and curriculum. So if you do even a search for that or even your student affairs division, so a lot of your student support departments, they may be able to assist you with that. But I just wanted to give you an additional resource or an additional area that you can check into. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Michael. We have a question from Javier. Javier, would you like to state your question? Hello, everyone. Sorry. Um, so we've heard that some, sometimes the EWs, the emergency withdrawals, will negatively affect their eligibility because of an attempt. Uh, and I know some of the Los Angeles area financial aid individuals were having a conversation about it maybe not affecting their eligibility as an attempt uh, in the future. Uh, and I just wanted to see if there's conversations within the state to on that topic. Thank you, Javier. Any feedback from our CSAC team on emergency withdrawals? This is Steve. I, I think I understand the question as far as uh, depending on when they withdraw from classes 
and we would look at that on an individual basis, but we're also having conversations about uh, how we can deal with that for this particular term during the coronavirus uh, crisis. So uh, we are having conversations and we'll continue to, to um, think about solutions for that so we don't penalize students who do have to drop out as much as possible. So yes, that conversation's ongoing. Well, doesn't the Ed Code state that the SAP is based on the federal um, SAP criteria? And so if the federal SAP criteria based under the CARES Act provides a concession where we can elim where we can discount, um, we don't have to count classes that are not completed. So if SAP at the federal level is adjusted, wouldn't the CSAC automatically be adjusted because that's what the uh, statutory law says? That's the conversation we're having okay. now. We need to make sure our system can deal with that as well. So um, yeah, it's definitely an ongoing conversation. We wanna make sure that we're in line with the, um, the federal regs that are coming out and the federal law that's coming out, but also SAP is generally the campus's responsibility and they would let us know if the student is eligible or not eligible and then we will work with that. We have a response from Imelda. Imelda, would you like to explain? Okay. Do you have any other comments or questions? Any other students on the line that would like to chime in and share their concerns? Imelda, to you, have unmuted. Would you like to yes. add on? I was um, scrambling, looking for my mute button. I'm sorry. This is Imelda. I'm uh, a director for um, one of the Tulsa programs uh, located in the Bakersfield area. Um, so I, uh, I also work for Bakersfield College. And so EWs are currently not affected by any, any federal financial aid including the terms of loans, SAP, everything. So they can drop with an EW. It's really, um, they can drop with an EW anytime, but that is a case by case. It's also, there's also some local decisions in there by colleges. Um, and so for our college, we know that students can drop up to the last day um, of the term and get an EW, get all their fees, um, return if they paid out of pocket and things like that. But as far as federal is concerned, if you get an EW as a student, your financial aid is not affected. Thank you. And also a local decision, mm -hmm. if you are able to uh, do third repeats, if you are able to, um, you know, register for the class before your grades roll this semester if you wanted to retake that class in the summer. Um, of course, the class still has to be retaken if you are planning to transfer um, or, or get your, your diploma. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm adding again our Google form onto the chat box. We have two minutes left on this call. So please feel free to submit any questions or concerns that may come up that you receive from undocumented students or students as a whole. And we will try to get that information up on our webpage as soon as possible with the right answers and information. We will also be posting the link on our social media. So feel free to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at California Student Aid. We have a hand raised from Erica. Is it okay to share the form with our um, California Dream Up to consider institution? I don't see why not. That should be fine. Do we have any other questions? CSAC team, any last words?
This is Steve. I would just say thank you for all the comments and questions. This is really helpful to us as we continue to work our way through the situation uh, with COVID-19. And answers are coming daily from different sources and questions are coming in through our call center. So we want to make sure we're responding to all of them and we'll, we'll continue to do that and we'll continue to have discussions here to try to see how we can serve all of our students as the, in the best way possible. Thank you, Steve, and thank you everyone again for taking the time to be on this call. We really appreciate your insight and guidance. We cannot say that enough, um, and we hope to continue these conversations, and please feel free to reach out to us. I will also include my email, um, same as my colleagues have, but feel free to reach out to any one of us, and at the end of the day, we're coming together to put our students um, as our priorities, so I'm glad we can share in that goal.